Right, we'll start, start again now the mic is working. Welcome this morning to uh, our 9.30 seminar stream. I hope you all slept well. Good to see you bright and early. Um, this morning, our seminar is on faithfulness in all things, women and girls. So it's lovely to see women and girls here this morning. And I'd like to welcome Inongis Saluka, who has come from Glasgow on a whistle-stop tour to Keswick to speak to us. Inongi also works full-time in a cancer charity, as well as being involved in lots of other things, enjoying sport and, and blogging on issues of, uh, for women and girls and how to live wholeheartedly for Christ. So I hope you're ready for a fantastic seminar. There will be questions at the end, so if you jot any questions down as we go along, there'll be a time to ask Inongi questions at the end of the seminar. So let's pray as we start. Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for this chance to think through what it means to live for you, to find our identity in you and live that out in our lives. I pray for Inongi that you would help her to communicate clearly from your word. Pray that you'd give us open ears and open hearts and a willingness to put into practice the things that we learn this morning. For Jesus' sake, amen. Good morning, everyone. Um, yes, yeah, as, as Claire said, my name is Inonge, and I'm so excited to be um, discussing this topic with you this morning. We're just going to be thinking about what it looks like for women and girls to live faithfully for Christ in the hope that this will shape how we view ourselves as women, as girls, in a Christ-centered way, but also in how we go about discipling the women in our churches, if you're involved in, in that kind of ministry. Now, this is a topic that I've spent, to be honest, most of my 20s working through. And, and if you had told me maybe even like 10 years ago that I would be doing a seminar like this on this topic, I, I wouldn't have believed you. I probably would have laughed in your face. Like, me, Inonge, having anything helpful to say about women? Um, and I think that's because of something I was wrongly convinced of, that, that whatever the ideal Christian girl or whatever the ideal Christian woman was, that, that I wasn't it. So when I was a teenager, um, a lot of the teaching that I received at the time, and sometimes I would just go into a bookshelf and just like pick up a book, um, and a lot of it focused on how to be the right kind of Christian girl, with a focus on future marriage, so, I mean, I was 14, so I was like, okay, right. <laughs> um, there's a lot of chat about how to be intentional in how I lived so that one day I would make a good wife for someone. And I just wasn't particularly interested in that. Well, mostly because I was 14. And, and so I thought, well, is this it? Is something wrong with me here then if I'm not interested in that? And then there were some books that um, wanted to rightly talk about how we should dress as, as Christian girls and Christian women. But then they went on to give lists of like yay and nay kind of items of clothing. And sometimes those lists never quite worked with my body shape. So I thought to myself, well, am I, am I doing this wrong? And, and other times, there are some resources and some books that emphasized the, the right kind of personality to have as a Christian. So you're meant to be mild and quiet. <laughs> but I was very talkative and just a bit loud at times, to be honest. So again, I had the same thought. I'm just not women in properly here, and I'm not quite sure I actually ever will. You see, I, I had the right desire. It's, it's a good thing that I wanted to live a life pleasing for the Lord, um, but I searched for that in the how-tos. How do I be a Christian girl properly? Where's the list? Where's a checklist I can just tick off, and then I'll be fine? And all I seemed to get in response was, well, not like that. Whatever you're doing, not like that. And perhaps you can relate to this in some ways. Uh, in fact, I've realized as I've spoken to um, different women of different ages that we, we've all felt like this at some point. 
whether that's what society says about being a woman or even sometimes our Christian circles and Christian subculture. And so I think it's important to, live, um, to think about how to live faithful for Christ without it feeling like a guilt trip. So I hope that by the end of this session, you won't leave feeling guilty, but feeling encouraged in Christ. So just to start off with, um, I've got a few discussion questions, just a couple of questions. It's maybe a bit tricky to discuss in groups, so maybe just, um, just think about it, write some notes there, um, and I'll just give a minute or so. And, and the first question is, um, can you relate to that experience in some way that I've just described? Are there ways in which you feel you don't measure up as a Christian girl or as a Christian woman? When I say girl and women, I'm just, that's more age thing. Um, and the second question is, why do you think that might be? What, what, what do you think has influenced or shaped how you view yourself? So if, if you sit next to somebody from your household, you can maybe have a chat, but if you're sitting on your own, um, just, just a couple of minutes and just think through that and then we'll move on. I think we'll just bring the discussion back in. Um, we can think about it later if you have got a bit of time afterwards just to reflect on this. Um, I don't know what came up in your discussions or what um, came to mind when you were reflecting on that on your own. But I think one of the main problems is that our starting point when we are thinking about what it means to be a Christian girl, Christian woman, a starting point is all wrong. We start with the lists when we should start with Christ. I mean, I love lists. I don't know about you. I, I actually love just creating lists more than doing the things that are on the lists. Um, but we love, we love lists. There's a comfort in them. Um, and our book titles reflect that. You know, five ways to create lasting friendships. Right? Seven ways to strengthen your marriage. We, we love formula. Who doesn't? Uh, I think... It's, it's not inherently wrong to have lists, but um, sometimes there's a comfort because you're told exactly what you need to do, and then you feel like you've done the job and you can just move on. They can be helpful, of course. Um, some book titles that are my favorite have five ways to do something, which is helpful to just summarize things. But for the most part, the Christian life doesn't quite work that way, does it? The Bible doesn't quite work that way. It's not just full of lists of the things we should and shouldn't do. And I think when we reduce the Christian life to lists, and when we reduce our discipleship as women and girls to lists, even to try and define what it means to be a faithful Christian woman, I think we're in danger in a few areas. So the next, the next thing I want us to think about is the problem with lists, the problem with some of these lists. And the first is that our discipleship will be culturally constrained. Very often when we read lists and try to apply them, we bring our own cultural assumptions to them. If, I, if I'm doing something, I'm creating lists, I'll bring my Zambian Scotness culture to bear on that. And I deliberately shared some of those examples um, about why I felt I didn't measure up when I was reading some of these books, when I was receiving some of this teaching, because they were actually written from a Western lens and they didn't translate to, to a Zambian. Their definitions of femininity were sometimes Eurocentric and their explanations that I read about what it meant to be a faithful Christian mother, just by way of example, were written from a middle class Western nuclear family with economic security lens. And I just thought that wouldn't work in a village in Zambia. It just wouldn't. So I think if we want our discipleship to be relevant and applicable to different women from different social and cultural backgrounds, from different age groups, we need something more than just nice, tidy lists. Okay, so not only can it be culturally constrained, it can also be experience-driven. We take good biblical principles and we apply them in a way that might genuinely work for us. It's, it's good to apply the Bible to our lives. But the problem comes when we try to make that application the formula for everybody else. And while sometimes it can be helpful, very often it doesn't quite translate as neatly as we would like it to. 
God made women. God made women and girls. But he did not create us the same. He did not create a monolith. We have different personalities. We have different desires and passions. We struggle with different things. We have different circumstances. And the nuance to apply scripture in light of this diversity can often be absent when we just fix our, 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 our lists, um, our, our discipleship to just the lists. And the third danger is that we can be prone to legalism. It's legalism prone. Because we focus so much on how to do the right things to fit the right model, well, those that can tick off the things on the list, like dun, 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 um, they can maybe look down on those that don't. They're just not biblical enough. And so shame is hipped on others, creates pride, envy, jealousy, and shame. So, is there a better way? I think there is. Um, I think our starting point is really important here. We must start with Jesus. We must start with Christ. And in order to think about what faithful Christian living looks like for Christian women, we need to start with Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So I want us to think about identity because identity matters. Identity matters. So if you've got Bible, turn with me to Colossians. Uh, chapter 1. It's on the screen as well. Um, Colossians chapter 1. And we're going to be reading from verses 15 to 23. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 23. For a bit of context, I'll just start reading from verse 13. This is what it says. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross." Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and earth, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. I love these verses in, Col in Colossians. And just for a bit of context here, the Apostle Paul is, is writing to the Christians at the church at Colossae to, to help them grasp the centrality of Christ, both in his work of creation and in his work of reconciliation. Because grasping who Jesus is will be important in understanding their identity in order that they might be stirred on to persevere in the gospel. And so we too need that starting point. So let's unpack some of this. I want us to look at two things in relation to Jesus, that we are made by him and reconciled through him, and that we are made for him and set apart for him. There's a handout on this under, um, on the Keswick website under the session, and which you can look at later. So any Bible references that I've got um, can be found there. But let's just unpack some of this then. Look with me at verses 15 to 17 in Colossians again. Here we see two key truths. Everything was made through Christ, 
and everything was made for Christ. That means he was there from the very beginning, eternally existing as God the Son, and everything was made through him. And so when we read in John chapter 1, um, and we read in, in Genesis, in the beginning, God, we can see that in the beginning, God made all things that exist through Christ. And all things includes us. After he made the heavens and the earth and the plants and animals, we are told that he made human beings. Keep your, keep your hand in Colossians and just look with me at Genesis chapter 1. In Genesis chapter 1. And verses 27 and 31, so verse 27 tells us about how God made us. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. And then verse 31 says, of all of God's creation, that God saw all that he was made, and it was very good. So that's our starting point. God made us, and unlike the animals, he made us in his image crowned with glory and honor, the psalmist says in Psalm 8. And he creates us in a specific way. He creates us male and female. He created us not as angels or spirits, although he could have done that, but with bodies, male and female bodies, and he declared that to be good. And so as we reflect God's image, that is expressed in our maleness or our femaleness. And so if you're a girl, let me just say that, your body is good. If you're a woman, the expression of God's image as you live your life is done as a woman. And sometimes our culture tries to separate the, the body from the inner person, who you really are. But the Bible celebrates the value and dignity of the material physical realm, including the human body. It celebrates the differences of male and female as the handiwork of a, a good and a loving God. I just think that's worth saying. Of course, of course we are more than our biology. We are more than our bodies, for sure, but we are not less than. Now bodies matter because God says they do. Womanhood is glorious because God says it is. You're not a woman because you're fierce. You're not a woman because you're a mother. You're not a woman because, insert whatever anybody says. You're a woman because God says so. And because he says that's good. And because he is the one who designed it, we don't have to manufacture our femaleness or make it fit into a list of ideals because from the beginning, God gave it to us. He gave it as a precious gift woven into his story of creation. He made women in his image as women with inherent value and worth. Why am I starting with this? Because grasping this is liberating. When we understand where our identity comes from, it liberates us from trying to manufacture it for ourselves. With the shifting winds of society and sometimes even Christian subculture. So we are made in the image of God. Um, as women, and God said that it was good, but we know that that's not the end of a story. Because although God made everything good, including our female bodies, because of the fall um, that we read about in Genesis 3, sin entered the world. Sin has distorted everything, our relationship with God, but it's also distorted our bodies. And so we are, body and soul, broken by sin. And of course, that will impact how we view ourselves as women. And you see that in the world, don't we? But as Christian women, if you're a Christian today, that is not the end of a story. Glance with me again at Colossians. And we're going to read verses 21 and 22. Once you're alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body. This is the gospel. Through Jesus, in his self-given sacrificial death on the cross, God has made it possible for us to be reconciled to him as we were made for. We are reconciled to God, and we're told it's through Christ's physical body. He didn't just die a spiritual death, but a physical one. Rose again, physically, with the hope and promise that our broken bodies will be renewed and restored in a new creation. So if your body feels broken, if it doesn't do what it, it wants, what you want it to 
This is the hope that the Christian worldview gives. It's good news, isn't it? And furthermore, we are also told that if we have believed the good news of the gospel, we are actually in Christ. And so we have a new identity, a restored identity. We are a new creation. We see that in, in, two, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We have a new name. We are not just women. We are Christian women. We're not just girls. We are Christian girls. Christian. And that is our primary identity that we belong to Christ, and that can never change. Because it is him who defines who we are and what we do, even as we live as embodied women and girls. So, if you're a woman, you're a woman, it is good. And it's how God made you in Christ to reflect him. Christ in his body on the cross has restored you to himself to present you as holy, set apart for him, to live faithfully, as he made you. So knowing who you are and knowing whose you are are so crucial in knowing how you ought to live. And that brings us to our second point. I want us to think about the fact that we are made for Christ and we are set apart for him. Back to Colossians. In verses 16, the second half of that, we are told that all things have been created through him and for him. That's Jesus. So in Christ, not only do we grasp who we are, our humanity and how that is reflected, we're able to make sense of how we are to exist in the world and how we are to live. And because Christ is the goal of everything, that should frame how we live. Colossians goes on to say, if, if you read that, um, I, I'd, I'd encourage you just to study Colossians. Um, it, it's, a great, it's a great book. It goes on to say that not only were we made for Christ, we have been saved and reconciled to God in order that we might live for him and to continue to live our lives in him, rooted and built up in him. And you notice a lot of this in him language, in Christ, emphasizing a beautiful reality of our union with Christ. Because we are in Christ, he shapes all that we are. He shapes all that we do. And that means that we can trust by faith that when we rest in this identity, in who we are as women who are in Christ, as we remain rooted in him and as we grow in his likeness, we can trust that as we do that, as embodied women, we will be living faithfully. We won't just be content with having a list of, of to-do things on a checklist. We will seek to know, love, and treasure Christ our Savior, who is the goal of all things. We will seek to learn from him, humbly sitting at his feet, the one in whom the treasures of all wisdom are found. We will tell of his glory, his beauty, his saving power, as we joyfully partake in the great commission of making disciples. And as the Holy Spirit, given to us by Jesus, works in our hearts, and lives, we will show the world what he is like as ambassadors. We will recognize our need for the gospel all the time. And we will stop striving to earn our value and place in this world. The world is trying to find its value and meaning. We don't have to do that because we can rest in the finished work of Christ. It's done. And in view of God's mercy, we will offer up our bodies physical bodies, and all of life to him. We will live a life of faith firmly fixed on Jesus. So in our final section, I want us to think of some practicalities, I guess. What does it look like to live the Christian life by faith in every circumstances as women when we grasp this identity? So we're going to be thinking about being faithful in all that we do, being faithful in all that we do. And there's two sections under that one is to think, us, think about, sorry. Um, we are shaped by his word and shaped also by his church. So turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3, um, verse 16 to 17. I'm just going to read that quickly. It says that all scripture is God-breathed and is useful to teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God 
may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. What does living a faithful life looks like? It looks like letting the word of Christ dwell in you richly, as Colossians says. I don't know what you're expecting from this session. If you, if you came expecting maybe a study on a passage that just has the word girl or woman in it, I hope I haven't disappointed you. I think it's, it's only right that where the Bible specifically addresses us as women, that we play, pay attention to that and the applications that are made. So don't think I'm hating on those passages. I'm not. They're in the Bible, which means they're true and they're good. But I do want to emphasize that all of Scripture, all of it, is given to all Christians to equip us in living lives that are befitting of who we already are, of who our identity is in. Jesus exhorts his followers, men and women, to remain in him and in his words that they might bear fruit, fruit of righteous lives that he saved them for, that they may become more holy. All of scripture is profitable for this. There are no pink bits and the girls and the blue bits for the boys. No, the whole counsel of God is given to the people of God that they might follow him, submitting to his word as he works out his purposes in their lives. And so God uses his word through the Holy Spirit who lives in us to encourage the weary and the brokenhearted, to convict us when we sin, to bring us back to him, to warn us when we are tempted to walk away, and ultimately, to show us Christ, that we might hold fast to him and rest in him. So we learn and grow in faithfulness as God uses his word to shape our character as women and girls in different circumstances. So when we are dealing with grief of losing a a loved one, when we're dealing with the pain of a broken heart, when we are dealing with the fear of the unknown as we move grades, move schools, move home, move job. When we are experiencing the simple joys of life, laughter and comedy, beautiful walk, a beautiful piece of art, cleaning one taco in a football game. When we are weary with dealing with chronic pain, chronic illnesses, when we're dealing with the stress of exams and peer pressure, when we're dealing with financial difficulties, when we're experiencing the blessing of good friendships, good marriages, or painful ones, when our children go to to know and love Jesus or when they walk away, in, in motherhood, in unwanted singleness, in ministry life, in life, in all of this, we learn what it looks like to work out salvation as we walk by faith and grow in holiness. So we are shaped by his word we're also shaped by his church. I want us to think about the women of the Bible. As well as his word, God gives us some examples too. We can, we can see that through the scriptures. There are many examples of, of what that looks like. Um, I don't think any of these are meant to be like a single template, like, you know, I follow what this person did and that's it. Um, Bible narratives are, are not meant to be prescriptive in that way, but I think they give us a diverse picture of what it looks like to live the Christian life as women. They give us examples of different kinds of women who honored the Lord faithfully in their different circumstances. We see different kinds of women, young and old, rich and poor, single and married, in ministry and in the workplace. And here are just a few. Um, You'll find this in the handout if you download that later. So we've got... um, We've got Phoebe. Um, Phoebe is mentioned by the Apostle Paul in in Romans 16. Um, And we're told that she was active in the church in some way. Um, She was faithfully serving. She was a partner in the gospel and she used her resources and position to support gospel work. We are told of Priscilla or Prisca, whatever your translation says. And he was a married woman who alongside her husband had worked and, and traveled and ministered with Paul, risking both of them risking their lives for the gospel. And we're told of Rufus's mother in Romans 16. She doesn't actually get a name, she's just Rufus's mother. <laughs> um, and we're told she was motherly and nurturing. She ministered with motherly care and was a blessing to those around her. It was a blessing to the Apostle Paul. And in the book of Acts, in Acts 16, we are told of a woman called Lydia. 
She was a dealer in purple cloth, we are told. And in those days, that was like big business. So she was a wealthy, business-savvy woman. And when she came to faith, when she came to know Jesus, she opened up her home and was hospitable and used what she had um, for the disciples. In 2 Timothy, in the first chapter, we're told of Eunice and Lewis. And the Apostle Paul says, I'm reminded of your sincere faith which first lived in your grandmother, Lois, and in your mother, Eunice. He says this to, to Timothy, a younger pastor. And what a beautiful picture of intergenerational discipleship. A, a mother and a grandmother who embodied a sincere faith. They embodied the gospel, faithfully passing it on from generation to generation. And Paul could see the fruit of that in young Timothy. There are many more that didn't get named but who were so shaped by the gospel that was visible in their particular spheres of life. The outworking of our faith is best done, not necessarily from reading a whole bunch of lists, useful as that may be at some times, but from sharing not only the gospel, but our lives together in the church, in the body of Christ, as we walk alongside and observe different women, different stages in their life who are living for Jesus. I want to talk a little about the women that have shaped me, women that I've observed from a distance. I'm, I'm encouraged by the 17-year-old who, in an increasingly secular society, Scotland is, <laughs> is about as secular as you get, in, in that kind of setting, she has always, from when I've known her, she's about 12, 13, always been open for her faith at school, regardless of what peers might think of her. I see the work of the Holy Spirit in her life as she seeks to honor Christ in her schoolwork. She's living out the words of Colossians, which says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord and not for human masters. I, I watch as she recognizes the temptation to place her identity in her academic and sporting achievements and seeks to pursue Christ and rest in the identity that Jesus has given her already as she cares for her friends and seeks the, be the best for them, demonstrating a heart for friendship that is rooted in the love of Christ, a love that is self-sacrificial, expecting nothing in return, in a culture that says, me first. I learned a lot from the retired single woman who served as a missionary many years ago in Asia. I'm amazed to see her trust in God as she left home comforts to spread the gospel and continues to do so now she's back. She's content in her circumstances, serving others faithfully and opening up her small home in hospitality. When I watch her, I see that it really is possible to live as a single woman, not waiting for a groom before my life can kick in, but living life waiting for the bridegroom, Christ himself knowing he will return any moment, but not waiting passively, but actively, using the time, resources, and gifts that he has given to live faithfully in anticipation for him to say, well done, good and faithful servant. There's the working mom who loves her husband and her children, as she does so imperfectly, but leaning on Jesus and entrusting her family to him. I watch as she opens up a home and, and serves whatever she's got in the fridge, even if it's frozen pizza, showing that the heart of hospitality is not about worrying about perfectionism. As she does her job as best as she can for the glory of Jesus and tries to be distinctive in her workplace, although it's hard to be a Christian in that particular environment. And she shares honestly the challenges of this. And as she shares her life honestly, through that, I'm able to see the grace of God at work. And there's a retired widow with a quiet confidence in the providence of God who keeps serving him even through the pain of grief. She prays and encourages for others, and sometimes she gently rebukes. <laughs> I recall complaining for a very long time about how I hated the shift patterns of my job, and after very, very patiently listening to me the whole car journey, she simply replied, well, you were praying for a job and the Lord gave you one, did he not? Perspective, huh? These are real women that I know. <laughs> we, we have nothing in common for the most part. Do you know women like this? I'm sure you can think of a few examples in your own life. 
Just write them down and reflect on what they have taught you. And so I just want to say, how do we learn to live a life for Jesus as Christian women? How do we learn what perseverance looks like to keep going? We actually learn this from the ordinary women and men, the men too in our churches, who embody Christ's likeness as we share our lives in community. And as we do this with women who are not like us in many ways, young and old, different stages of life, we actually sharpen each other. Just hang around with people that are not like you and you get different perspective on things, don't you? We're able to see each other's blind spots. God uses the stories of others and their faithfulness in their lives to show us how to keep going. And as for us, well, as life changes, relationships, the places we inhabit, as we change, God will shape our stories in a way that allows us to know Christ in ways that we, we wouldn't otherwise have done. He will show us the different idols our hearts are capable of being drawn to, and he will show them up for the sham that they are in comparison to Christ. God uses our stories too, the circumstances of our lives and the unique ways he has shaped us to show other women how the gospel embodied looks like. You need the church, and the church needs you. So just to finish off, to say that the body of Christ matters. In case I haven't labored that point enough, the church is important, but I think sometimes we neglect it. Maybe because it feels so ordinary. You're just kind of like, oh, is this it? Or maybe because it can be hard sometimes. That's the reality of church life. But the church is one of God's means of grace to help us to endure this life of faith. We have a shared identity with our brothers and sisters in Christ. We are united to Christ with them as we learn from each other and as we grow together. So just to summarize, God has made us in his image as women, an identity given to us that we don't manufacture. God has saved us and reconciled us to himself, giving us a new identity which is rooted in Christ. And he gives us his word which shapes us into Christ-likeness by his spirit in all of life and points us in all things to Christ. But he hasn't left it there. He has given us the body of Christ where we learn and are shaped in the outworking of our faith as Christian women that we might walk faithfully and live for Christ in all circumstances and in all things. Okay. So um, I thought I'd leave, I don't know how much time we've got. Um, questions? Got any questions or any thoughts from any of that? Um, and Claire will just try and find you and I'll read out the question. Have you any thoughts about gender inequality in the world as God may... Sorry, can I, can you? As God made men and women equal, um, have you any thoughts about gender inequality in the world? Yeah. Um, yeah, um, God, God, God has made us um, equal uh, with inherent value and worth, um, and the, the, there is a reality of gender inequalities that exist. We can't shy away from that. Um, and I think the Christian worldview provides us with a great um, foundation with which to actually say that that is an equal. Um, if, you, if you don't believe that we have inherent value or worth, um, I, I've noticed a lot of stuff around gender inequality, especially um, movements that try and empower women, um, focus a lot on what women can do or what women have achieved. So they'll say, you know, value women because women, you know, they can play sport too. Like, hey, look, women can play sport. They can achieve this, they can do all things. And I think it's great to value the um, achievements that women do. But if, if, you're, if that's all you're doing, then what you're essentially saying is women are valuable because they can do amazing things. But even the woman that isn't fierce or doesn't achieve a lot, is, is, is valuable because God has placed value on them. So, um, yeah, I, I think as Christians, we have 
<laughs> more so a better foundation for which to um, call out inequalities where we see them. Um, not on the basis that, you know, somebody is my sister or um, look at all the things they can do, but on the basis that they are made in the image of God and they're valuable. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if that answer the question was, that answered the question about gender inequality. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I'm just going to repeat the question just for the audio. So um, if I'm getting this right, um, in the Bible we, we see a kind of male-dominated society and um, patriarchal systems in, in one sense. And how do you help people that maybe just become Christians and they're reading the Bible and they think, well, oh, this doesn't look like it's, it's good for women. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's a great question. Um, and the first thing that I would, I would say is, is understanding the context in which the Bible is written. Um, it's, it's written for its time, so the, you know, the Bible isn't just something that we lift and directly apply to us. It's written in a particular context. And so the context in which the New Testament is written is, is first century Palestine and what's going on in, in, in those contexts. And the, the, the writers of the New Testament, um, you know, the apostles, when they're writing, are not necessarily concerned about um, society per se and um, how to fix things. They're, they're concerned with teaching God's people who live in those contexts what it looks like um, to, to live a, a holy life. So you, you see a lot of emphasis on, on character and how you should live regardless of where you are. And that means that the Bible can be um, applicable to women who live in um, more progressive societies, but even in, in places where they're oppressed. You know, God's word still says you are in Christ and, and this is what it looks like to live a life. So that's the first thing I would say is, is the emphasis of the Bible is, is speaking into a particular cultural context, but not saying follow this pattern of what this society was doing, but rather here's how God's, God's word um, shapes and applies to, um, to this particular context. And I think reading the New Testament as well, when you understand the, the context in which it was written, you will see that it is actually countercultural for its time. Um, the Bible actually does a lot of um, affirming the value of women um, in ways that maybe you wouldn't notice um, because we're removed from that society. The fact that women were um, in, in that society, they, they weren't really given much um, value and worth. Their testimony would not have mattered much. And yet, the, the first women who witnessed the resurrection, the first people who witnessed the resurrection were women. Um, and and, and the, the writer of the Bible record that. They're not embarrassed by that. They could have, like, you know, removed that and just pretended because it would have looked better for them in that, you know, it would have been more legit if it was just men spreading the gospel, but there was women in there as well. Um, and I think we see how Jesus relates to women and how he treats women. Um, you see that in, in John's gospel, for example, in John 4, the, women, the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, um, and how he, he humanizes her and he, the way he talks to her um, and, and how he relates to women. We see that well, this is God in the flesh and this is how we relate to women. And so I, th I think that can, be, um, that can be helpful as well. So um, a book I would recommend for that, just thinking through the women and the Bible, is a, a book by Wendy Alsup, A-L-S-U-P, called Is the Bible Good for Women? And, you know, th that little snippet was not enough to kind of go through all, all the threads, but it's a really good book for um, unpacking some of that. And, and actually that <laughs> the, the Bible for its time was actually counterculture in, in um, yeah, enforcing the value that women have. Does that answer the question? Thank you. Yeah, I really appreciate, thank you, the way that you've talked about the diversity of uh, women, that we're not all a monolith, we're not all the same, uh, the way that we see that in the Bible. But in my experience, at least, we don't always see that in churches. Often, I think churches do have quite specific ideas of what women are like or should be like or how they can serve. And I wonder if you have any thoughts on how churches could do better at encouraging and valuing the diversity uh, amongst women. Yeah, um, so just to repeat the question, um, sometimes in churches we don't always see um, the diversity of women and there's sometimes like a monolith of what's expected of what a woman should be. Um, I think the, the best way of countering that is, is teaching that focuses on, um, that gets the foundations right. Um, I think 
if we become, like I, like I mentioned at the start, obsessed with, with lists and, and fitting the norm, um, then yeah, we're always gonna end up just creating a list that looks like us. Um, so one of the ways we'd actually be emphasizing this, this idea of identity and what does the Bible actually say about women um, in terms of personalities and lists? Not a whole lot actually when you look at it. <laughs> a lot of it focuses on character and, and how, how we are becoming more like Jesus. So I think that's one way is, is actually saying, hey, in, in our teaching when we're teaching about women, how about we, we, we gaze upon Christ and, and that, that helps. Um, the second way is just hanging out with each other a bit more um, in real life. Um, and then you, you actually start to see, as I've hung around with women, I, I had a certain perception of them, like what I thought they were like, and then um, I visit their home, and they're just not like that at all. And that's actually what's helped me. When, when I thought I'm doing it wrong, because everybody else has got it sorted, as I interacted um, on a more personal level in real life with, with women, I just realized that just, that just wasn't real, a reality. So sometimes <laughs> everybody's playing this pretend game where we all kind of look the same, but actually when you get close to people, you, you actually learn a lot. So I think, um, yeah, in, interacting with each other, um, interacting out with our own like bubbles as well. Um, if, if the women in the church are all the same, I, you know, we've got the global church, so interacting with other women, um, other Christian women, and we will actually just, it, w it won't be possible to create a monolith because we'll just be so different. Um, so I think there was a lecture yesterday um, by Jason on thinking about cultural diversity and, um, and, and racial diversity. So that would be one aspect as well. When, when we open ourselves up to um, other worlds that aren't like us, it actually just challenges us, our own perceptions. So those would be my two main things, the foundations and also um, let's hang around with people that are different from us. Um, so in like, we know that men and women are equal and, but they're also different because, um, like, in terms of, like, church, like, normally it's the men who are in leadership and not the women. So what are your thoughts on women in leadership? And, um, like, what's, what would Jesus want us to be like when we're, like, I don't know, gifted at talking or speaking like you're doing at the moment? Yeah. <laughs> Nice is a question there. Um, so I'll just, I'll just read the question. Um, just said, talked a lot about women being, uh, men and women being equal, but also being different. Um, so what do we make of um, male leadership in churches um, and you know, women in leadership positions or women who are gifted um, in, in leadership and, and their place in the church? Is that about right? Yeah. Um, so yeah. It, I'm quite conscious that people hold different convictions on this. Um, my, my own personal conviction, I'm complementarian, um, and that means that I believe that, that men and women are, um, are equal, but they're different. Um, and that difference is not ontological. It's not because um, women are inherently um, not leaders and men are inherent leaders. Um, I think that's a, a role. Um, that is um, played out in the church. Um, and so the elders in churches um, should be not just any men, but actually qualified men. There's a list about their character, their godliness, their humility, um, qualified men um, in, in churches. And that men and women should um, therefore submit to the elders in those leadership positions. Um, different Christians in complement in that, who, who maybe share that view in part would um, have different views about w whether women should, um, should lead at all or should speak at all other than to just women. Um, I think apart from that particular provision about um, qualified male elders and, and, and pastors, I think women can teach men and women in other contexts. And the reason I think that is because some of the passages that I mentioned there with women, they're, they're doing ministry um, and Paul mentions their, their work and service. Um, and they, they, there's lots of Bible passages about brothers and sisters encouraging one another. And I don't know how you can encourage one another unless you're also you know, speaking the truth and, and teaching one another. So I personally wouldn't um, you know, be, be, an, be an elder or, or preach to the gathered church, but I teach men and women in different contexts, and whether it's youth work or in parachurch settings. And so I think that's one way that women can exercise their gifts. So I, I think that um, if, in terms of encouraging women in leadership, I think we need to think carefully about um, what the text says and what it doesn't say, and try to encourage 
all other areas um, to encourage women to speak because they won't, in my experience, necessarily put themselves forward. And so um, part, part of the reason why I'm here is because one of my elders really encouraged me in using my gifts. And so he's a male elder, but when he talks to me, I don't feel like he thinks I'm inferior to him. Um, he's a brother in Christ and he encourages me and so do the other elders to use my gifts. So for church leaders, I guess they can be encouraged to um, see their sisters in Christ as equals, regardless of whether they're elders or not, and encourage them to use their gifts. The teaching gifts are given to men and women. Um, in Ephesians, where it talks about the, like, the gifts of teaching and prophecy, it's men and women that those are given to. And so I think the men, qualified men teaching is not about gifting, um, but just about role, because God is a, is a God of order. And um, yeah, the, the text doesn't actually expand on that. It just says, <laughs> this, this, is, this is what the order should be like in the church. And I think let's not um, expand on that and try and work out why that is. I think we run into trouble when we do that. So yeah, those are my own views on yeah, men, and, men and women in the church. Did that answer your question? No, there's, there's another question. So like, see if you... If a man in leadership, a man in leadership, actually abuses his position and kind of treats you inferior because you are a woman, like it does happen because we are broken people. How do you like respond to that in a godly way, that also kind of like respecting them as well and yeah. loving them? Thank you. Um, so if you're in a church where um, you have men that you know treat women like they're inferior in some ways um, because of that structure. Um, I share my own personal experience because it was a good experience, but I'm quite conscious that a lot of women are in churches where um, that's not true. <laughs> they're not valued. Um, they feel very much inferior and they're treated as such. Um, and I think it comes back to what kind of leaders should we have? So if we just have leaders that just want a platform, um, that just love the sound of their own voice, and we ignore the qualifications that are given for leaders in our churches, that they should be humble, that they should be kind-hearted, that they should be, um, they should be sincere, you know, these kind of godly qualities. Um, I would hope that somebody with those qualities would see a woman as a fellow image bearer and treat her as such. And so one way would be to, to pray that um, the, the men in our churches, the leaders in our churches, would have those qualities, that they would have a, a love for their fellow sisters in Christ and see them as Christ does, precious and, and set apart for Christ, um, with the same access to God that they do. Um, in, a pract in a practical way, um, I, I think it's okay sometimes to say, um, to be specific. So if somebody has said something in a certain way and just say, see when you say that in that meeting or when you spoke to me in that way, it just felt like you were treating me like X, Y, and Z and coming from a place of actually we are to rebuke each other um, and, uh, as well as encourage each other as Christians, um, then, then that can be one way of, of tackling it. I realize it can be tricky if you're like, I don't know, 16, <laughs> it's like a, a four-year-old man, but um, I think speaking about it and just saying, you know, this isn't Christ-like and this is why and being specific about our reasons helps people see, because sometimes people just don't see it. Um, you know, it's, it, it's, so, it's so surrounded in our culture and subculture that we don't realize that when we say certain things, um, they rub off the wrong way. So if we don't say anything, um, then they might never change. So, yeah, but I would, I would spend a lot of time praying for the hearts of people to change so that their, their, their very disposition is one of humility. Um, yeah. It's more an observation than a question about um, the importance of uh, women-only groups in church, women's fellowships, things like that. I'm a mother, member of Mother's Union myself, and I really value that as a, ours is a women's-only group. I just wondered if you had anything to Sorry, say. Sorry, I'm really struggling to hear. Right. Uh, the value of women's groups at church. Right and uh, what your comments might be on that. Yeah, the value of women groups at church and the value of that. Um, I think they, they, have, they have their place. Um, 
it's hard to pitch them right sometimes because what time do you have them? If you have them in the evening and then sometimes young moms won't be able to come along. If you have them in the mornings, working moms. So um, I, I, you know, I don't envy people that are trying to put programs together for women and trying to get the right time and just pitch it at the right. Uh, but I think, yeah, they do have value because in, in that, as we read the Bible together or even just, you know, chat over a cup of coffee, we're, we're sharing our lives, isn't it? So that's one practical way of of um, doing that in church together as women. But I think there's also value in interacting with men and women. So my church set up, um, we, we, our, our community groups are mixed. And so um, one of the things in, in, in light of the previous question that's helped with the whole men not thinking we're inferior is because we're studying a Bible passage, you know, looking at Revelation, a question is asked and I say something and a man says, oh, that's interesting. And they learn and so we're, we're mutually encouraging each other. So I think we need both. I think we need the um, cross-generational women together discipling each other, whether that's one-to-one or whether that's in, in small groups, um, whatever that looks like. But I think we also need men and women sort of interacting with each other as well um, to help the body be healthy. So I, I, yeah, and the practice of, of how that works will look different in different churches depending on the dynamics and, and who you've got. Great. Well, we're out of time now. Thank you so much for such great questions and for fantastic on-the-spot answers. It's not easy <laughs> to answer off the cuff. So thank you so much. I think that's been so helpful to think through what it means uh, for our identity in Christ to be lived out in our lives as women. So um, let's show our thanks to Inonge now. And let's pray to finish. Heavenly Father, thank you that you did make us male and female. Thank you that that was in your great plan, that we both are your image bearers. And I pray that as women, you would help us to uh, live that out in our lives. Help us to be rooted in our identity in Christ, to live for him uh, as the very different women and girls that we are, to show our uniqueness in the way that we serve you and live out our lives for you. For Jesus' sake, amen.